Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you who have come today uh, and given us a portion of your schedule to listen to today's special presentation, uh, jointly presented by Park Systems, and also uh, Professor Rigoberto Advincula of Case Western Reserve University, whom we are very excited to have again for another uh, presentation in our series of nanomaterials webinars. My name is Gerald, and I work in marketing operations for Park Systems. We are an atomic force microscopy system manufacturer based out of Santa Clara here in California in the U.S. And today, uh, as I mentioned, we are going to be having Professor Rigoberto Advincula, the director of Petro Case, the Macromolecular Science and Engineering Department of Case Western Reserve University, to give a presentation today on nanostructured and functional templated coatings, smart nano coatings. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, let me go ahead and turn things over to Professor Advincula, and we'll go and have the presentation start. Professor? Yes. Thank you, uh, Gerald, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, we are uh, doing this both as a webinar and a live uh, seminar format. So, wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good early morning. Uh, today, I'm going to present to you work we've been doing on nanostructured and functional coatings. And along the way, we hope to see opportunities for us to understand the uses of AFM and its importance in uh, characterization of coatings. So first, let me talk about uh, where we are. We are at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, this is the uh, uh, home of the Spartans. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, we are located uh, in a very uh, cultural center of Cleveland called University Circle, home of the Cleveland Orchestra and Cleveland Museum of Art. So let's start with coatings uh, in general. Coatings are very useful because uh, it allows us to protect, to package, uh, or simply to enable uh, architectural or uh, structural integrity. Uh, uh, so in this case, we can call it as a barrier application. And that is protecting the environment from affecting the bulk material. On the other hand, we should look at it also as a way of protecting the environment from the bulk material, whether it's uh, con uh, containing a toxic substance or simply preventing spill from a liquid uh, material, then it becomes a packaging proposition. So coating is both a protective and a packaging solution. Now, uh, the impact of understanding the potential of this for innovation is that we can develop products, we can develop coatings, we can develop different types of uh, bio-based uh, um, uh, raw materials or even applications where we can have uh, good properties such as printability, transparency, color integrity, durability, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, even applications towards cosmetics and health care. Uh, key to that is also finding ways we can utilize nanostructuring, nanomaterials that can enhance performance or highlight properties that are durable and, as I said earlier, uh, innovative. Uh, there are ways we can do this, either by looking at the use of nanoparticles, use of nanostructuring methods, enabling chemistry at interfaces, or utilizing different types of composite materials, which I'll highlight uh, in this talk. Another is looking at ultra-thin films, where we can order the structure all the way to the nanometer level, whether it's the absorption or deposition of a um, surfactant or a reactive precursor material or simply applying methods such as vacuum deposition. In fact, our group specifically have highlighted methods of utilizing electrochemistry, electropolymerization to pattern, as well as grafting of materials or polymer systems on surfaces. A polymer indeed is a genuine um, nanomaterial in the sense that if you look at the dimension of a single chain and its ability to interact with colloids or emulsions, either as a surfactant or a particle itself, the dimensions are certainly within the area of 
a few nanometers uh, to hundreds of nanometers to be relevant. On the other hand, we can order them at surfaces such that we can nanostructure them with different types of phase aggregated, multi-layer, or film structures that are useful as membranes for separation uh, methods. And here you can clearly see the other types of nanoparticles, whether it be quantum dot or emulsion polymerized particles or graphene or carbon nanotubes are relevant in the space or modular design of nanostructured materials. So let's start by talking about grafted polymers. What are grafted polymers? Well, if we look at the ability to functionalize a surface with a polymer additive that is not only physically adsorbed, but chemically adsorbed. This means that we can graft a polymer several ways. We can graft it onto a surface, meaning an existing polymer can be grafted onto a substrate that's reactive, or we can do the polymerization itself on a surface populated with monomers, or we can grow polymers directly from the surface via surface-initiated polymerization. And this can be done on a flat surface, flexible surface, or even a freestanding membrane that can be highlighted and separated from the substrate. Here, for example, is a scheme that shows we can do this type of um, grafting on a particle surface. So we can take, let's say, a clay particle or a silica nanoparticle and then uh, populate the surface with surface initiator such that we can grow the polymer as a brush in a coarser geometry, thereby changing the steric stability of the colloidal particle with respect to solution. So we've done this effectively to functionalize things like clay or silica uh, in order to prepare nanocomposite materials with unique properties. Uh, another way is that we can graph polymers directly on particle surfaces as dendritic system. As shown here, uh, through a rational design and synthesis of electroactive monomers that then can be grafted on gold or cadmium selenide or different types of nanoparticles, which are very interesting materials by themselves. We can control the energy transfer, charge transfer, or even fluorescent materials of this uh, um, size uh, aspect uh, ratio, a high surface to volume ratio materials, such that they can be used for sensing or different types of um, display applications. Now, in the area of clay nanocomposites, one can functionalize clay and thereby changing its ability to disperse or observe the percolation uh, threshold to observe any thermomechanical improvements on the film property itself. And this is in comparison with the traditional method of incorporating clay which is usually done by melt intercalation. So that means that surface functionalization is a way to work with clays like montgorillonite, bentonite, hectorite, uh, laponite, or different synthetic clays that are actually used in many applications, including coatings and drilling uh, fluids. Uh, in the area of polymer electronics, uh, a lot of film film work is also going on. This could be in the form of solid state display devices such as organic or polymer light emitting diodes, uh, photovoltaic devices or solar cells, actuators, chemical and biosensors. This means that we can make uh, useful organic and polymer films that are functional in the realm of optoelectronic uh, uh, devices as well as chemical or biosensing, which we've demonstrated in many ways. So, for example, we've reported on utilizing um, polyvinyl carbazole grafted on an engine thin oxide layer, uh, which is useful for uh, solid state display devices such as LED uh, or even solar cells. In this case, what we've done is we've successfully grafted polyvinyl carbazole and improved the blue emission uh, properties and lower turn on voltage of polyfluorine, which is a standard to light emitting polymer. This goes way back uh, uh, more than 10 years ago when we started this work. On the other hand, uh, we've successfully grafted um, uh, polymer brushes on indium oxide so that we can utilize them for efficient photovoltaic devices, IPO being a very useful transparent electrode in many smartphones or 
uh, display devices. In this case, you can see uh, that AFM was used uh, very um, uh, well in differentiating that of a rough ideal surface. And then after functionalizing it with the polymer brush, we homogeneously covered the roughness and at the same time improved the performance of IPO. As shown in this uh, current to voltage uh, performance where we not only lowered the turn on voltage, but we also improved the stability of the device. Uh, on the other hand, the same scheme can be uh, done with a solar cell uh, based on a Bob heterojunction system, such as polythiophene and uh, PCBM, a fullerene material, where we grafted the polymer uh, through a polymer brush and then utilize uh, cross-linking uh, in order to uh, produce a cross-link film. And uh, here are the, the different stages by which we started with an ITO a polymer grafted brush, and then a polymer electro crosslink uh, PBK, showing the change in the morphology, uh, and then following its behavior as a photovoltaic device, where the PBK brush uh, was similar in performance to a spin casted P PSS uh, whole transport material, in comparison to an ITO surface that uh, is unmodified. So. In this case, one can say that the performance of PBK is similar to that of a spin coated P.PSS, but more durable. Now, let me go to the realm of pattern films. Uh, how do we pattern and how do we template? Pattern films can be accessed through lithographic or non lithographic methods. This means you can employ uh, techniques like micro contact printing electron beam lithography or use of block of polymers to produce order. Or one can use uh, SPM um, nanopatterning based on uh, deep 10 nanolithography. That is taking an AFM tip, functionalizing it such that one can deliver an ink to a surface as shown here, or do multi-mode uh, uh, patterning. Uh, and of course, in terms of resolution all the way to a few nanometer level, one can use uh, focus ion beam or electron beam lithography, lithography methods. So we started uh, basically by demonstrating that we can pattern materials using microcontact printed electrodeposition. In this case, these are blue emitting materials that was patterned by microcontact printing and then depositing them directly on the surface such that we can have a micro LED device. And that means that the polymer here uh, can be used perhaps in the future for micro displays. Um, on the other hand, we can access all the way to nano level patterning. In this case, we demonstrated this work by using what we call a conducting AFM or current sen sensing AFM method, where we actually polymerize, or ele rather electropolymerize, or even by dual heating, created these patterns with sub-100 nanometer resolution using an AFM tip. Uh, so we demonstrated this nanolithography method uh, utilizing this uh, uh, material that we reported which can be patterned even at ambient conditions. In fact, one of the first work we did this was on a high humidity environment like Singapore. Uh, here is actually uh, two such polymers that we synthesized that we uh, prepared as films. Uh, this work goes back uh, in 2008. Uh, two of my former uh, PhD students, uh, uh, Go Chan and um, uh, his wife, uh, Peng, uh, what they did was um, Cheng Yu Wang, they, uh, Cheng Yu synthesized this uh, polyelectrolyte polymers and then deposited them on a substrate surface. We did this on a layer by layer basis, hence you have this increasing thickness and absorbance of the material as it's deposited in the film. And then we electropolymerize this through the carbazole units, just to prove the reactivity of the carbazole unit. So the proof is we can pattern them uh, using AFM. Uh, in this case, we can simply move the tip and form lines or squares or different shapes. Uh, and uh, as a, a team, I asked the two of them to work together 
uh, to produce this series of uh, concepts. And uh, one night when I was at the lab and I was about to go home, I noticed that Gochan made this heart-shaped pattern. Okay, and I asked him, "Why did you do that? This is a lab. We're supposed to make serious stuff." You know? And then he said he liked it. Okay. And then in three weeks' time, they came back to my office, both of them, and they said they were going to get married. Okay, so this lab in my lab. <laughs> anyway, uh, the uh, the reward also is they were successful in publishing this and making cover page uh, on macromolecules. All right, so from here uh, we actually uh, uh, reported the use of electropolymerizable macro initiators. What these are is these are um, monomers that can be electropolymerized, in this case, tertiophene to polythiophene, which contains a raft chain transfer agent. This raft initiator can be used to polymerize polymethyl metacrylate, as shown here. And then we can make a block with polystyrene on a grafted brush, as shown here. So we have polymethyl metacrylate, polystyrene grafted on the surface. Or in this case, we can uh, combine a carbazole and a, uh, a styrene. Uh, and so these are what we call electropolymerizable macro initiator uh, polymer brush synthesis. We actually demonstrate that this can be patterned efficiently using a pattern ITO. Uh, in this case, we pattern the ITO, etch it such that we can polymerize the initiator and grow, grow polystyrene on one side whereas the rest of the pattern will have the exposed glass that can be functionalized with an ATRP initiator. Once we functionalize this remaining portion with ATRP, we can grow another polymer, which in this case, a polynitam hydrogel. So the question is, uh, what is the utility of surface chemistry and surface functionalization um, analytical methods here? Uh, as shown here, an AFM image that differentiates the surface uh, with the polystyrene polymerized on the ridges. However, after grafting the polynifam, we can clearly see here a difference in morphology uh, by AFM. Uh, it's even more dramatic when we see a larger scale. Uh, so AFM does not give that information to us. Uh, SEM does not give this information to us. So in fact, you only know it's polystyrene and polynipam just because I said said so. So to turn uh, uh, to more uh, combination methods of chemical mapping and spectroscopy and microscopy, we can utilize imaging, chemical imaging. In this case, this is a chemical image map of the two polymers uh, based on FTIR imaging with a focal plane array detector. So what we have here is essentially the uh, green color representing that of your polystyrene and the blue region here representing that of polynipam as observed by the carbonyl, CH, and NH stretching. So quite a powerful tool for differentiating patterns or domains with two different chemistries. Now let's talk about templated films and its relevance to nanostructuring. So template, templating can start all the way to the molecular level. Molecular level means we can start with chemical analytes that can be uh, sensed or observed uh, or detected with a receptor or a sensor. Uh, but in order to do that, the chemical analyte has to have a target probe or antigen-antibody relationship. In this case, um, a method called molecular imprinting allows us to make these artificial receptors or essentially in a lock and key mechanism, design a lock around a key. So usually we duplicate a key with a lock. But what do you do if you have a key but you don't have a lock? So here we make the lock. The lock essentially is a chemistry based on utilizing monomers and a cross thinker that builds a cavity of space and volume around the analyte such that the analyte is the exact shape, size, or covalent or non-covalent interaction of the cavity. So this principle is essentially molecular imprinting. The difference is that we utilize again those electropolymerizable monomers and printed them on a SPR chip. This is a gold surface essentially that is used for sensing or transduction based on 
uh, an evanescent wave uh, uh, or irradiation that decays exponentially from the surface. Uh, and this allows us to sense all the way to the nanometer level or the uh, nanomolar concentration. So this film, a biorecognition element, can be printed on the surface of your SPR. Uh, and here are some of the templates that we can print. Essentially, uh, theophylline, theobromine, caffeine, paracetamol, by polymerizing a uh, third iodine uh, acid group around it, we can build this cavity and then sense the presence of these drug templates. So for short, uh, this is a way of templating uh, a film with the original analyte that can be used to sense that analyte afterwards. Uh, here we can have, we've reported the uh, detection of sarin, dopamine, TNT, bisphenol A, melamine, all relevant analytes, pollutants, and this endocrine disrupting chemicals that can be detected as little as picomolar in concentration. Uh, so from molecular, we can go to uh, micron sizes. Uh, in this case, we utilized a colloidal templating method based on a particle that can be templated on a surface. This templated surface is made up essentially of colloidal particles that are hexagonally packed uh, on an uh, on electrode surface and then polymerizing around this uh, pattern so that you can get honeycomb, full dome, half dome structures uh, made of the original conducting polymer material. So we were successful in doing this and reporting the use of templating to produce this array films where essentially we have a conducting polymer array uh, with holes being that of the exposed uh, electrode surface. We can then backfill the electrode surface with another material or polymer such that we can have a combination of two materials that are uh, patterned bimodally on a surface of so conducting polymer and a polymer brush. And here again you can see the power of AFM uh, to observe the morphology or topology and then by switching to a conducting AFM mode one can observe the more conducting polymer versus the less conducting uh, polynipam in the middle. Now uh, we can do this chemistry rather by combining the uh, electropolymerizable macro initiator so instead of having a polymer polymer brush in the middle, we can have a polymer brush growing on the ridges and this has been demonstrated on two different chemistries but at the same time we can still grow another set of polymer brush in the middle. So this is the case of a polymer brush and a polymer brush on the same surface of two different compositions. Now let's turn to corrosion, a very important industrial problem which actually consumes about 6% of a country's GDP. Industrial coatings means you want to protect it from the environment, uh, whether it's marine, high humidity, temperature, or flow conditions. So in this case, uh, there are things that we can use to improve the performance, such as the use of nature-inspired superhydrophobic films. This is observed in many types of uh, surfaces and structures, ranging from plants to insects where we can uh, observe their, graph, uh, their resistance to wetting uh, based on a combination of Wenzel or Cassie Baxter approaches, a modification of the Young's equation. So here are SEM images of different structures that are actually able to self-clean uh, itself by preventing wetting of water in the first place. And this is explained where the Cassie Baxter approach it was that of a uh, de-wetting uh, uh, entry and re-entry phases of a droplet of liquid, essentially trapping air inside a ratchet light of structural ulcers that results in non-contact wetting. And hence, you get the superhydrophobic effect. So a superhydrophobic effect can be quantified and produced uh, artificially as well. So what are the uses of a superhydrophobic coating? Superhydrophobic coatings essentially allow us to produce uh, fouling resistant surfaces, whether it's a paint, textile, different types of uh, uh, appliances, pipelines, 
or even controlling flow assurance in terms of transport of liquids. So uh, the other case is a super oleophobic coating application where we uh, have essentially the opposite effect, that of oil uh, uh, replacing uh, that of water, and it resists the wetting of oil. So in principle, a very idealized film will be that of resistant to oil and resistant to water, meaning it will not wet in the first place. So if you can ever invent a paint that resists both oil and water, uh, you'll be very rich. Okay? So smudge free and non wetting. Now, uh, in our case, we actually utilized uh, a film structure out of uh, an over deposition or over polymerization of a surface with a, um, a, a polymer that we electropolymerize, as shown here. The third type in with an ester group or third type in an acid group, and the same tools. Uh, to uh, investigate their morphology with SEM or IR imaging uh, to determine the chemical uh, function and distribution. And uh, uh, these are a summary of the wetting experiments that we conducted. So uh, if we have polystyrene simply on the surface, this will result actually in a hydrophilic behavior. Quite interesting in that polystyrene typically is hydrophobic. But by making it as particles, we can make it hydrophilic. Uh, on the other hand, we can use polytype in them uh, to deposit directly in the film, and it showed a hydrophobic effect. Uh, with polystyrene, about 100 nanometer, we can get about 111 uh, in, in uh, wetting. And then at about uh, 500 nanometer, as a particle that's trapped on the surface, we can get a super hydrophobic effect. Uh, this super hydrophobic effect is interesting in that uh, we've found uh, properties that are able to resist uh, wetting even at higher temperatures, low pH, or different salt conditions. In fact, uh, it's also resistant to corrosion as well as bacterial growth. And I'll show you maybe some of those results later. On the other hand, you can clearly see the effect of the surface energy by uh, converting this uh, from an ester to an acid we lose the hydrophobic effect, instead we get wetting. On the other hand, by using a particle underneath the film, we get uh, a hydrophobic effect, not quite super hydrophobic, and then with 500 nanometer particles underneath, we get also uh, a good non-wetting behavior. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, we deposited uh, uh, this material and tested it for gasoline for kerosene, for oil, and it spread very well. So this is a super oleophilic material. Not only is it super hydrophobic, it's also super oleophilic. It hates water, but it loves oil. What can we use it for? Well, oil and water separation. So in this case, you can use it uh, perhaps in a device that's used to separate uh, water from produced oil and water, or materials that are useful for oil steam cleanup. Okay? And we are exploring some of these applications as well. Uh, another interesting property of this film is that it also changes in color with wetting. So you go from red to green. Red indicates that it's non-wetting, and green indicates it's wetting. Uh, it is what we call an electro chromic property that is combined with the wetting behavior. So in a sense, you can say that these are electrochromic wetting films that uh, exposes uh, uh, or changes in color with the change in wetting behavior. Uh, another is that we investigated their uh, anti-corrosion properties. Uh, in this case, the anti-corrosion was tested uh, by looking at the wetting behavior, the um, uh, electrochemical properties based on polarization and electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Just to confirm that we are looking at the same film, this is the SEM as well as the contact angle uh, superhydrophobic behavior. And here are the polarization plots that changes uh, with different pH. 
the bottom line is these films are stable even at a high and low pH. On the other hand, uh, using the film at 60 degrees C shows that they have very good stability. Essentially, the film that we are after is this blue color uh, polarization behavior. Uh, another is by EIS, Electrochemical Impedance Spectroscopy. Both the uh, both plot and Nyquist plot shows a good uh, stability of the film even after seven days, and that the non-wetting behavior produces an efficiency all the way to 96%. In other words, these are robust films that have very little diffusion or transport of corrodent to the other side of the steel. And then uh, there are also uh, uh, anti-biofilm formation. Uh, not necessarily uh, biocides or biostats, but they simply prevent bacteria like E. coli from thriving on the surface. And we've observed this not only with bacteria, but also with the protein absorption as well. So the super hydrophobic film has shown as little live and even dead bacteria even after uh, the uh, fluorescence uh, uh, microscopy steps. Now the last material I'd like to explore as a film composition is that of graphene and graphene oxide. Graphene is an interesting nanomaterial that uh, have many uses uh, ranging from uh, anti-static to antimicrobial to uh, display devices. The uh, uh, nanomaterial uh, has effective thermomechanical, but more importantly, thermal and electrical conductivity properties uh, similar to copper. On the other hand, by modifying it uh, using an exfoliation method uh, to solubilize it, one can uh, produce graphene oxide, which is essentially a graphene with a lot of uh, carboxylic, epoxide, and hydroxyl groups, products of the oxidation method. Here's a collage of the different uses of graphene oxide on a flexible substrate or a solid-state device or even paper. Uh, we reported the preparation of a composite of uh, graphene oxide with polyvinyl carbazole. Uh, these materials can be dispersed in solution or can be deposited as films. And we were successful, for example, in utilizing the same material uh, in a patterning scheme that you're now familiar with and that we can deposit the graphene oxide together with the PVK in patterns like this where we've demonstrated useful uh, applications such as transport uh, properties of membranes and ion-gated channels that may be mimicking that of nanovalves. And here are, uh, is, is the uh, molecular ion probe experiment as well as the XPS measurements that allowed us to distinguish the presence of holes of IPO on the surface of the film. Now, uh, these films, as I mentioned earlier, can be uh, uh, dispersed in different solvents. This is a picture of the um, graphene oxide platelets that uh, was prepared using an oxidative method, exfoliation method. Uh, once we uh, disperse them, we can prepare them as films or as solutions. We can actually investigate their antimicrobial properties. So what we will observe is that this graphene oxide is actually capable, capable of killing bacteria, not just preventing biofilm, but actually killing bacteria. And we know this based on the optical density measurements of the dead bacteria. So graphene oxide, we get more dead bacteria, but more uh, convincingly with this fluorescence imaging experiments from switching from Pitsy to Tritsy, uh, we have the live bacteria that is observed under microscopy present on all films, but when we finally switch to the red dye, Tritsy, we get dead bacteria only present on the graphene oxide and graphene oxide PVK. We believe that this type of uh, antimicrobial effect is a combination of uh, radical oxygen species generation or morphology effects based on the platy nature of the material or even some type of forum sensing that turns off or turns on the bacterial uh, motility under these conditions. But nevertheless, uh, these antimicrobial properties might drive up even the use of silver particles in different types of coatings applications. 
Uh, here is simply showing that we can demonstrate this both in gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria uh, in terms of assays, as well as comparing it with fibroblast cells that uh, have uh, less than 20% toxicity, in other words, harmful to bacteria, but may be harmless to human cells. Good news for applications in terms of implants, catheters, and even different types of devices to prevent infection. Lastly, where does AFM fit, fit in? So here is a nice AFM image showing the uh, PVK GO when present as a film. Actually prevents biofilm formation and where we have PVK and ITO as a film without graphene oxide, we see lots of bacteria populating and growing as a healthy biofilm. So in this case, AFM non-contact mode allowed us to visualize uh, percent morphologically close the presence of biofilm without the graphene oxide. So with that, uh, I'm ready to close. I'm just going to give you a summary of my perspective on the futures of coatings. One is we need to focus on molecular and macromolecular design that is focusing back on our chemistry. Formulations and high throughput design will enable us to have multifunctionality. So you can see combination of materials that allow us to get different functions. There's a convergence of function uh, from a bottom-up approach that is if we focus on nanoscopic to macroscopic, we can understand function. On the other hand, convergence of design is a top-to-bottom approach, meaning what we know from macroscopic, we can go all the way to nanoscopic to understand first principles of innovation. Another is the importance of surface sensitive and analytical tools such as an AFM for probing structure and function in uh, these coatings, using nature inspired design in order to innovate. Cost effective and high performance materials are always welcome, which means translating to something that might be commercially useful. And then lastly, I hope I've inspired you through this talk to innovate. So with that, I'd like to close my talk and we'll be happy to take any questions from the audience. Wonderful. All right, so we do have a couple of questions now in queue in the questions module. Uh, for those of you who still have a couple of questions um, percolating, uh, feel free to take some time and then to, uh, when you're ready, type them in. Uh, but for now, we'll get started with the ones that we've already received. So our first question is, what is your knowledge regarding surfactants to enable optimum dispersion of nanometals within water-based coatings? Yes, uh, essentially surfactants are your compatibilizers. Uh, their ability to uh, uh, absorb cold Particles simply means that you have to look at the amphiphilic nature of the coating where your balance is. Uh, so, for example, if you're dispersing uh, metal particles on oil, you'd expect, let's say, a surfactant to form a shell around the metal particle with the hydrophilic group adsorbed to the metal and the hydrophobic part to the oil. Uh, one can go to different designs of surfactants. Essentially, very stable surfactants are in the form of uh, many different types of, uh, or many hydrophilic groups or ratios of uh, uh, the polar to non-polar group, as well as polymeric surfactants that tend to absorb uh, many grafting points on the surface. All right. Our next question from the online audience was, has there been any commercial coating of graphene on aluminum or fiberglass to achieve strength of steel? Uh, good question. Um, so, uh, just a short uh, clarification on nanomaterials. We, we, uh, we observe, and of course many people report on the interesting uh, uh, properties of nanomaterials, but one has to understand that there are several things needed to optimize nanomaterial action. One is dispersibility uh, in terms of a matrix. So, a nanomaterial is only as good as it is well dispersed or reaches a particular percolation threshold in terms of cost performance. Another is anisotropy. So materials, nanomaterials can be oriented to have an optimized effect. 
And then lastly, layering. Uh, so for barrier materials, they have to form essentially planar sheets to be effective as a barrier material. So as far as steel and its improvement on the mechanical properties or corrosion, uh, two things I can say is that nanomaterials, uh, if they are dispersed particles, certainly do not add much on the mechanical integrity of steel, but rather nanomaterials that form part of the uh, um, steel uh, crystallinity or uh, the main and grain boundary certainly changes the um, mechanical uh, properties of steel as well as corro corrosion uh, uh, resistance. On the other hand, um, graphene that is uh, uh, well distributed on a surface of steel as a coating all the way to a very planar uh, parallel to the uh, plane of the uh, uh, steel structure can have high barrier properties and uh, can have abilities to actually uh, disperse inhibitors uh, even in a controlled release manner. So we're very interested, for example, in utilizing graphene both as a barrier material but as well as a carrier for different types of corrosion inhibitors. Excellent. Moving on, our next question states, would polymer transport for electronics be similar to chemical transport polymers? Uh, polymers uh, can be classified into two ways in electronics. One, it can be an excellent packaging material or as an insulator or heat transport material. Another is electronic, meaning it can be electrically conducting or electro-optically active. So uh, part of it is uh, distinguishing what you want to use it in terms of those two modes. Now, uh, one thing about polymers as conducting materials, electrically conducting or uh, uh, transport carriers, in other words, uh, able, to, able to carry holes or electrons, which is uh, a lingo in, semicond in the semiconductor field. Uh, polymers are sensitive to oxidation. So the presence of oxygen, moisture, or anything that can disrupt the chemical structure in terms of uh, phi electron delocalization or charge hopping mechanisms tend to degrade their performance. So most polymers that are useful for electronics has to be packaged carefully or even uh, used uh, under vacuum. Great. The next question in the queue states, uh, what are the best coating polymers used with nanomaterials, such as graphene, for the purpose of antimicrobial applications? Okay. So a traditional uh, uh, antibacterial additive would be uh, silver, would be biocytes uh, that are organic in nature, uh, but uh, and even copper can be used for antibacterial. On the other hand, um, uh, one can, of course, go towards adapting nanoparticle size dispersions of these materials. In our case, uh, we are... Uh, uh, really exploring the viability of graphene that can be uh, optimized or activated or otherwise uh, understand the mechanism as an additive in killing bacteria. And uh, one, of, one of the things that we're interested with is, for example, enhancing the um, antimicrobial properties of graphene by uh, utilizing it either as a reduced or auto-activated uh, form. Uh, so that work is still in play. As I said, uh, we published a number of papers in this area. Be happy to work with a, a group, a coatings company, to explore further its optimization as an antimicrobial additive. Wonderful. Moving on, our next question states, is it possible to control the distance on nanometer scale between nanoparticles in the film by using such purposefully designed organic coating technology? Uh, okay, so if I understand this question, it would refer to the particle, controlling the dispersion of the particle uh, to uh, a coating that separates it from other particles. Uh, by uh, steric or electrostatic methods. One can, of course, coat uh, nanoparticles, as I've shown here many times, with a shell of a polymer or even a uh, charge that uh, prevents it from agglomerating or aggregating when dispersing formulation. Uh, another way that I can interpret this question is in terms of nanostructured 
films where the nano material is confined to one layer and that is you want the nano material to either uh, if it's functioning as a barrier to form a continuous layer uh, on one sheet and uh, if you want to use it as a functional nanomaterial on the exposed layer it has to be present on the topmost surface and remain active for its intended purpose. So again, uh, two ways there of controlling the nanomaterial, either as a particle in a core shell uh, geometry or as a nanostructured ultra-thin layered film in a layer-by-layer -layer basis. All right. Our next question states, since cellulose is a naturally occurring polymer, is it possible to functionalize cellulose in the same way that you would a synthetic polymer? Of course. Uh, cellulose uh, is a hemiacetal. It's a natural polymer with lots of hydroxyl groups. Different types of cellulose can be uh, esterified uh, or converted to other forms. So in this case, if you have a nanocellulose, which is a fibrillar derivative uh, derived from different plant sources or different degrees of crystallinity, Yes, you can do what we call a polymer analogous reaction and react the hydroxyl group with another functional uh, transformation. So, for example, hydroxyls and acids will give you esters. Hydroxyls and isocyanate will give you urethane. Okay? Hydroxyls can be utilized for eterification and so on. So the same chemistry that can be done on a cellulose single polymer chain can be done on a nanocellulose as a fiber and you can achieve that surface functionalization. Great. Our next question, <clears throat> which is your experience regarding some additives to increase the viscosity of these formulations in order to print them? So viscosity, of course, uh, several classes of viscosity modifiers. Uh, that means you have uh, gelation effect networking. Uh, you can also have uh, a swelling effect, of course, uh, on a hydrogel. Uh, you can have uh, uh, increase in viscosity in the form of additives like clay or different types of uh, uh, density agents that uh, uh, remain uh, homogeneous but changes the density of the material. So, so in principle, uh, this viscosifying systems uh, uh, can be uh, mix or combine with another additive that can enhance its uh, uh, rheological properties over time or release certain types of actives with different uh, uh, viscosity conditions. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of interest on what they call stimuli responsive fluids, which means you can control the viscosity uh, as a function or presence of thermal, electrical, or pH uh, field effects. Thank you. Looks like we're coming up on the home stretch of the questions we have in queue. Our next one states, how do you determine how well graphene oxide, GO, is dispersed in polymer matrices? So uh, first we can employ tools like IR or Raman to confirm their presence, to confirm uh, their uh, state of aggregation. Uh, so in the case of Raman, which is quite an effective tool looking at the G and the D bands, we can see how much of the graphene, uh, graphene oxide is aggregated uh, in terms of the carbonyl, uh, uh, epoxide, and other IR active groups. We can monitor their presence. In fact, what we have observed is the way we prepare them, the way uh, their thermal history tells us is that graphene oxide can change to its reduced form uh, depending on some of these conditions. So in fact, processing might actually change the oxidized state of graphene oxide into various forms. Uh, so uh, monitoring them even by uh, UV vis spectroscopy is a simple way because obviously the graphene uh, itself has a near infrared uh, type of absorption, whereas uh, Graphene oxide in the presence of the carbonyl groups will be uh, shown clearly in terms of the IR signature. Thank you. Uh, we have four more questions uh, here in the queue, uh, and I believe uh, we'll be closing out the session in a couple more minutes. So uh, let's go for these four more questions here. Uh, first, what kind of polymers do you recommend for 3D printing of different solutions in order to pin the drops better on substrates? Okay, so. Uh, 
3D printing, you have uh, FDM, SLA, sintering methods. Uh, so if we talk about polymers, FDM uh, re will require thermoplastics, things that can be extruded. Uh, SLA will require things that can be uh, polymerized, photopolymerized. Uh, sintering will require um, polymers that can be melted and heated. Uh, there are other types of 3D printing that can require <coughs> solutions or more similar to inkjet printing. So in this case, uh, uh, take your pick which of those methods uh, will be useful for making your object. Uh, the thing with polymers and 3D printing is that most of these 3D printing devices are not uh, made uh, for an optimized material that necessarily gives the same properties of a polymer that's been processed by molding or extrusion. In other words, most of the polymer materials out there was not optimized for an actual part application. Rather, they were optimized for, for, for processability. So the problem with the current 3D printing space is most of what's printed out there is only good for prototyping, not for actual parts. Uh, and that is basically the current state of polymer materials for 3D printing. Excellent. Our third to last question states, is graphene oxide deposited on steel surface coplanar with the substrate surface? Well, uh, several ways to do that. One can deposit graphene by CVD methods uh, uh, or plasma. Basically, you uh, form graphene in situ as a film. Or you can disperse them, as I've shown you, in a solution or a polymer and one can coat them as a liquid dispersion. So in that case, uh, you'd hope and you'd want to build some way of making the graphene to lie flat on the surface planar-wise, especially if you're using them as a barrier material or anti-corrosion material. So uh, in, that, in that case, uh, probably the most economical uh, and uh, easiest way to do it is to do a solution type of coating. Very good. Our second to last question states, do you know how well a surface will remain hydrophilic, uh, specifically over months at a time? Good question. Uh, hydrophilic, super hydrophobic, different types of wetting behavior changes over time as they are exposed to the environment. Another is the surfaces can be exposed to abrasive conditions. So the game is on. Uh, whether one can develop what we call self-healing materials or self-replicating materials, that preserves their wetting behavior over time, or even materials that can resist abrasion, uh, uh, good lubricity, and so on, and at the same time maintain their wetting behavior. So it's, it's an active research for many groups. It doesn't mean that you have a super hydrophobic film. You can keep it. So the game is maintaining it. Just like if you own a car, it doesn't mean that you can buy a BMW, that you can keep your BMW. You have to maintain your BMW to make it a BMW. All right. Very good uh, analogy there. Uh, our last question is actually more of a request from the original question speaker. Um, earlier in the uh, Q&A session, there was a question regarding the uh, application of graphene to materials such as fiberglass to approach the strength of steel. Uh, the question speaker uh, would like to have that answer repeated if possible. Okay. So I probably didn't get it the first time. Yes, of course, uh, there's a lot of interest on carbon-based materials, carbon fibers uh, that are thermosets or thermo, uh, thermally cured to replace metal as a lightweighting uh, system. So yes, graphene, graphene oxide are good candidates for that uh, in terms of uh, its possible replacement as a lightweight, high-strength material. It, uh, uh, it, it, it it's a challenge to prepare what we call two-dimensional flat materials that uh, will have the uh, strength equivalent that of a metal. Uh, one thing for sure is that uh, this um, graphene, uh, as part of a composition, whether it's a composite or a coating, will have good thermal and electrical conducting properties. Whether it's a good mechanical replacement of a metal is yet to be seen. But yes, the advantage, possible advantage there is that of lightweight. Very much appreciated. Thank you. And with that, we've exhausted the queue of questions that have been submitted virtually for this particular session. Uh, and at this time, we've also reached the time limit for today's nanomaterials webinar. And on behalf of uh, Park Systems, 
as well as Professor Advincula, we'd like to thank you very, very much for taking time again out of your busy schedules to join us today. Uh, if you're not aware, this is a series of nanomaterial webinars with Professor Advincula that we have been uh, conducting uh, over the course of the year. And if you'd like to see previous recordings of uh, other topics covered by Professor Advincula, I have sent a link into the chat module that should be visible to everyone. Uh, if you can't see it, uh, simply look for the uh, Nano Academy on parkafm.com. That's the Park Systems uh, Company website, parkafm.com. Um, and also, uh, these webinars are monthly, so keep a close eye out for any press releases or emails in your inbox uh, for our next uh, webinar, which will take place uh, around this time in November. Uh, with that, any closing thoughts, Professor? Well, uh, again, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, being part of our webinar series. Certainly, I appreciate uh, Park AFM for sponsoring these uh, events. And uh, from your live audience here at Case Western Reserve University, 